So uh, we'll look for some uh, bright spots, at least in, um, in the exchange of information and, and understanding from this talk. Uh, commenting on, on, uh, on Professor Song's remarks are two people. One of them you can see, and one of them you can't. Uh, Paul Jara, over here, is, uh, good morning. I, I take back what I said a moment ago. <laughs> you can see all of the panelists now. So. Uh, Paul is president of Global Strategies and Transformation, uh, which is a strategic planning consultancy and provides national security strategic analysis, uh, defense concept oh, development, um, and uh, military transformation expertise. He's, uh, if he were still in uh, a naval uniform, as he had been for many years in the past, uh, he would be um, one of the Navy's foremost, if not the foremost, naval expert on Asia, East Asia. Uh, Mike Pillsbury, who arrived a moment ago, um, is a defense policy advisor, uh, former government official, and author of many books and reports on, uh, on China. Uh, Mike was Assistant Undersecretary of Defense for Policy Planning, and he was responsible for implementing um, a program of covert aid known as the Reagan Doctrine uh, in 1975 and 1976. While he was an analyst at RAND, uh, Mike published articles in foreign policy and international security that recommended that the United States establish intelligence and military ties with China, the proposal which was commended by President Reagan and Henry Kissinger and James, former Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger, uh, became U.S. policy during the Carter and Reagan administrations. Uh, but as you will see, that is not a sufficient description of his views or ideas. So. Let me turn the podium over to Dr. Song, and uh, thank you very much for making your time available to this morning, and we're looking forward to listening to your remarks. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Cropsey, and good morning, my fellow, my commentators, and ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, it's my great honor to be invited to come here to exchange views with you uh, on the issue related to sovereignty and maritime disputes in the East China Sea and South China Sea. And thank you very much for that remark introduction. And then I, I consider myself a student of law and politics. When I say something wrong about law, I'm a political scientist. When I say something wrong about uh, 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 international relations, I'm a lawyer, a student of international law. But thank you very much, again, about the title, South and East China Seas, Challenges and Opportunities for Enduring Regional Peace and Security. In September, three years ago, the American journalist uh, Nicholas Christoph wrote and published in the New York Times. And he said that, look out for the Diaoyu Island, or Senkaku Islands. And he predicted in 2010 that tensions have erupted over the sand bearing rocks in the Pacific that you may never have heard of. But stay tuned. This is the boundary dispute that could get ugly and someday have far-reaching consequences for China, Japan, Taiwan, and certainly the United States. And he said, when he said that, it was about the maritime boundary disputes over Chunxiao Youtian, Chunxiao oil field in the East China Sea. But later on, we are seeing the disputes escalate, escalated into sovereignty disputes over or Senkaku Island. 
And this is another uh, well-known scholar, Robert uh, Kaplan. He wrote in 2011, and he said that the 21st centuries defined the 20th century is the defining battleground is going to be on water. And the South China Sea is the future of conflict. And it was said in 2011. So right now, we, we are seeing two important East Asian semi-enclosed seas, which are considered the troublesome flashpoints in the Asia Pacific regions. So there are a number of flashpoints in the Asia Pacific. We know the disputes between ROK and Japan over Tokto or Takeshima. We also know the disputes between Russian Federation and Japan over the Northern Territories. We also know the dispute between China and South Korea over the Sorok Huangyanjiao in the East China Sea. Of course, right now, the East China Sea disputes and the South China Sea disputes are the most troublesome ones. In addition to that, we, we also know that Taiwan Strait, in the past, it was one of the flash points which have a lot of potential impact on the peace and stability in the region. But today, of course, we are going to focus on East China Sea and South China Sea. And in February last year, the Vice President at that time, Xi Jinping, met with President Obama. And during the visit, he pointed out that China is firmly committed to the path of peaceful development and is sincere in developing relations with the United States. And he also said that the Pacific Ocean is wide enough to accommodate the two major countries of China and the United States. That was made in February last year. And then in November last year, we know the 18th Party Congress, the meeting there. And one of the important reports is related to maritime security, sovereignty, and maritime claims. And after that re uh, meeting, we know that in China, a lot of developments which are related to safeguarding China's sovereignty claims and maritime claims in both East China Sea and South China Sea. And we also see the reorganization of the, the PRC State Oceanic Administration and they are going to establish Chinese Coast Guard, for example. So a lot of things going on in mainland China. Many try to accomplish the goal. That is, we sovereignly safeguard the country's maritime rights and interests to establish the PRC as a maritime power. And in November last year, Mr. Xi Jinping made his first references to China dream when he was promoted to the top Communist Party post. And his dream is a stronger nation with a strong military. Today, we know that he's going to meet with President Obama. Of course, maybe the First Lady is not going to California, but maybe, and this photo was taken before. And they are going to meet today, so at this uh, Sunny Lanes uh, um, in California. So maybe that uh, was the right choice for a politician to have some kind of prediction about the weather. Uh, today, we, we have a big rain here in Washington, D.C. But must be reason. Things happen with the reason. Why you pick California? Camp David in the west, in addition to the east. Why? Must be reasons. So um, at the summit, 
are, are they going to talk about the East China Sea issues? Are they going to talk about South China Sea issues? Then the question, if they talk about that, maybe not, because I consider this summit as kind of ice-breaking summit of the friendship summit. It is taking the incremental to, to build up that kind of atmosphere for the two countries to discuss more important issues of a wide range of issues, including climate change, including economic cooperation, and, and so on. So they might, may, might not talk about East China Sea issue and South China Sea issues. But my question is, the East South China Seas are smaller than the Pacific Ocean. But are these two important seas wide enough not only to accommodate the US and China, but also Japan and Taiwan in the East China Sea? And big enough to accommodate Taiwan as well as ASEAN claimants, in particular the Philippines and Vietnam in the South China Sea. So what will be the China's dream in the East China Sea and South China Sea? We know that uh, South Korean president visited Tokto. And we know that the Russian prime minister visited the Northern Territory, Kyrgyz Island. What about person she visited Wooded Islands? This Wooded Islands in the Peroso Islands. And we know that the tourism is, it, is going to be held in Wooded Island, and Peroso Islands, and Sansa City, I will mention that later where he visit Pagasa. Pagasa is one of the uh, second largest island in the Perso, in, in the Islands, where he visit Taiping Island, the largest in the Spiritually Islands, now is occupied by Taiwan. Even he will travel to James Shoal, north latitude around four degrees, that the southernmost claim by both Taiwan and mainland China regarding the U-shaped line or night dash line. Is he going to do that? If he do that, if he does that, what will be the impact to the regional peace and security, stability? So what about President Ma? President Ma, does he have a dream as well? a dream for him and a dream for Taiwan. If he really works harder enough and successfully transform the East China Sea, the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea from a sea of confrontation to a sea of peace, friendship and cooperation, it might not be the dream for President Ma to win the Nobel Peace Prize during his last three years of his second term, a dream. We all have a dream, American dream, Chinese dream, Taiwanese dream. <coughs> and this dream was given or talked about by, for example, Professor Jeremy Cohen from New York University Law School. So a number of people are talking about this. So if that's the case, is that possible or likely or necessary for President Ma to visit Senkaku Island or Diao Yi Dao? in the East China Sea. At present, I don't think so, unlikely, because it's crossing the red line drawn in East China Sea by both China and Japan. Certainly, President Ma is not going to do that. But what about the Taiping Island? Taiping Island, the largest in the spread of the islands, and effectively controlled by the ROC government, should he go to visit that island? If he goes, will U.S. government say, don't go there because you are making trouble, because you are trigger disputes? Should, he, should, should President Ma listen to U.S. advice? Or he should consider from the perspective of Taiwan's national interest, especially sovereignty and maritime claims, in the South China Sea. 
So it's East China Sea and South China Sea both have serious, complicated sovereignty and maritime disputes. This is the picture and the island for your references. I know all of you are familiar, familiar with this. And South China Sea, again, very, very complicated. And today, I only have the 20, 20 minutes. I don't think I can discuss in detail. But there are some similarities and differences between these two seas. In the East China Sea, there are three sets of territorial sea law, three sets of exclusive economic zone and continental shelf law, and three baseline claims. And there are other similarities, such as unilateral action taken by each claimant. And of course, they are also the rise of nationalism in the East China Sea. And in this body of water, there are two fisheries agreements, one between Taiwan and Japan, which was signed on April 10th this year. Another one between Japan and China, signed in 1997 and entered into force in the year of 2000. And there are other possible maritime corporations, such as joint development of oil and gas, but for that joint development uh, understanding or MOU between Japan and mainland China, agreed in June 2008, China said, no, it's not an agreement. It's understanding. So it's not an agreement. So there are some kind of uh, differences there. But other, let me allow, uh, allow me to, to, to tell you uh, the similarities between these two uh, two seas, the, both of them are large marine ecosystem. In the in the world, there are 64 large marine ecosystem. South China Sea and East China Sea are two of them, and they are also semi-enclosed sea. If you, in accordance with Article 123 of the 1982 United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. China and Japan are both party to that convention and bear the obligation to enter into cooperation regarding marine scientific research, marine environmental protection, and other matters. That's the treaty obligation. Taiwan is not a party to that convention. But anyway, so I, I bring your attention to Article 23. And Article 121 of the convention, that's about the legal status of island, can Diao Yi Dao or Senkaku Island generate 200 miles easy? If Japan can claim 200 miles easy for Okino Torishima in the west, Western Pacific, why not Senkaku Islands? If that's the case, what about 200 miles exclusive economic zone, maritime zones? So, and then these two important seas, of course, we know the importance. All of you know that abundant marine, li marine living and non-living resources, oil and gas, gas hydrates, minerals, uh, important trade routes, and has something to do with the 1951 San Francisco Peace Treaty because Japan returned Taiwan Penghu including Diao Yi Dao, Senkaku Island, and Peros Island, plus Spratly uh, Islands. And so there are other, a lot of information. I, 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 I don't want to get into detail. And then maybe differences. The differences between the two parties, uh, the two seas, the parties in the East China Sea, only maybe three or four. But in the South China Sea, there are more parties. And the number of occupied islands in the South China Sea, there are more. For example, Vietnam occupied 29 islands in the Spratly. China occupied eight. Taiwan <coughs> occupied only one. Philippines occupied around nine. Mal Malaysia occupied around five. But in the East China Sea, only the Delta Island, eight land feature in the East China Sea. And we are seeing the asymmetric as military capabilities. In the East China Sea, the number one, number two, number three 
economies in the world, China, United States, Japan, are involving that dispute, right? When I say involving in general term, because U.S. say that a neutral position. And then we are talking about the, the application of the Mutual Defense Security Treaty in the East China Sea with Japan and the United States, in the South China Sea with the Philippines, Thailand, and the United States. So, of course, but U.S. say that we are going to defend Japan in accordance with Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Security Pact. But in the South China Sea, maybe, maybe the U.S. position is, is different in terms of defending the Philippines when something armed uh, uh, conflict happened. And then in the East China Sea, there's no so-called U-ship line or night dash line. But in the South China Sea, of course, the most challenging question is to clarify the meaning and legal status of the U-ship line or nine dotted line claimed by Taiwan and mainland China. And there are also the differences regarding security dialogue process. In South China Sea, I think you are aware of the workshop, the informal workshop on managing potential conflict in the South China Sea, which began in 1990 until today. It's tried to manage potential conflict in the South China Sea since 1990. But today, we are seeing the rising tension in the South China Sea. But there's no such workshop in the East China Sea. In that regard, is it possible for the U.S. to play a role to propose an informal workshop of managing potential conflict in the East China Sea, or propose a peace initiative similar to President Mar East China Sea peace initiative? So there are differences, and then in the South China Sea, we are seeing outsiders um, getting more concern, for example, India, Japan, Australia, and European Union. But in the, in the East China Sea, based this kind of concern, not, not as, as, as wide as in the South China Sea. And of course, then in the South China Sea, right now we are seeing the, the, the challenge arbitration between the United States, I'm sorry, between mainland China and the Philippines. And what about the outcome? the impact of that arbitration, where the tri arbitral tribunal to judge, yes, it has the jurisdiction. And what if that happened? How does China respond to that outcome? And then what about the regional code of conduct? In this coming summer, maybe in this coming November, at East Asia Summit or at the Chan ASEAN plus one, that's plus PRC summit, they adopt a regional code of conduct for the South China Sea, and Taiwan is ex excluded. But for that policy outcome, I believe the United States will welcome that. If that happens, it will bring positive impact on maintaining peace and stability in the South China Sea. But would that happen? What action will be taken by China to stop from adopting that regional code of conduct? Um, a number of, p please stop me if I, 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 I need no, no. to stop. Yeah, because it's com complicated, and I, I know time is kind of limited. A number of factors that trigger conflict in the both East and South China Seas. The number one, increasing Chinese assertiveness. When we're talking about increasing Chinese assertiveness, maybe we need to add one footnote. Is this responsive or assertive? And you heard about the saying, you kick me one, I kick you twice. You kick me one, I kick you harder. It's Chinese response to the action taken by the Philippines or by Vietnam to assert or to uh, reaffirm their ter territorial claim in the South China Sea or by Japan in the East China Sea. That's why we are seeing that kind of uh, assertive activities carried out by PRC. But uh, no matter what, we have to admit is one of the largest, important, most important factors that give rise to tension in the South China Sea and 
East China Sea. Of course, that come to the, the other one, the other factor, counteraction and counter action and counteraction by Japan, by the Philippines, <coughs> by Vietnam, and even by Taiwan. And if you are not strong enough, you are not capable to counter action taken by the PRC government, then you will ask for help from your big brother friend in the United States. Give me more arms, give me more support, more f official statements, say something in the uh, U.S.-Japan Security Pact that Article 5 does apply to the disputes in the East China Sea. So another factor to, to is U.S. concern and involvement. Certainly, we are seeing that development. The two days ago, uh, uh, Acting Secretary Assistant Secretary Yong mentioned about the U.S. position regarding South China Sea issue. And we also read U U.S. official statements about the disputes in the East China Sea. Both of the recent developments indicated that the United States is taking a position that to, to oppose unilateral action taken by the party to the dispute to change the status quo. Now the question is, what is status quo? Who is triggered the disputes? When is the critical date? Who is effect effectively control those disputed islands? Is disputes existing or not? So many, many issues and factors, and so these are uh, background information for you to, to think about that. That's what I'm, I would like to reiterate and bring your attention to this, this, this question because in order to understand, follow the recent development in both East China Sea and South China Sea, you have to discuss this issue. Is, di is disputes existing? When did it begin? begin? When is considered a critical day? Who is exercising effective control? Who is changing the status quo? And by what means? Threat to use force? Coercive way or what? Who trigger or give rise to tension? By what kinds of action? What are the key players? What role played by international law, in particular 1982 Law of the Convention? And what about U.S. concern and involvement? Should U.S. deter that action taken by the disputants? So this is the action trigger the tension in the East China Sea began in April 2012 when Tokyo Governor Ishihara came to the United States and he spoke at Heritage Foundation that he's going to buy islands. Can we consider it a trigger? Can we consider that it trigger or force China to respond? And then, this is in April 2012, when Philippines warship was sent to the disputed water to detain the Chinese fishing vessels, can we consider it a trigger? So recent developments a lot, recent, I, I don't think time allow me to go into deep uh, detail, but I just go very quick, uh, maybe from April 2012, and then in June 2012, Vietnam passed its national ocean law, the law of the sea, which entered into force on January 1st this year. And then China responded by establishing so-called Sansa City. Sansa, which means it cover Perso Islands, McClesfield Bank, and spread to the island. And that within this nine dotted line. In addition to that, China decided to send military uh, garrison headquarters or personnel to protect the Chinese sovereignty or sovereign rights in the established Sansa city. So we, we we also know that in September 2000, last year, the, the previous Noda administration, Prime Minister Noda, decided to nationalize those islands, the purchased islands. That triggered a very, very strong 
response from China. So we see, we 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 see the the action taken by China includes includes the full include the following seventeen baseline points announced in the East China Sea, the map and patrolling, and then submit the outer continental shelf to the United Nations Commission on the Continental Shelf, the limits of continental shelf even sent aircraft in the air to patrol. So that triggered a lot of tension and possible accidental conflict between China and Japan in the air and in the, at the sea surrounding Senkaku Island or Diaoita Island. So that's the very, very trouble. And then come to the Japan said, China is changing the status quo. But Taiwan, de uh, China denies, no, you are changing the status quo because you nationalized. In 1972, 1978, we agreed. We have we reached consensus that we put aside the disputes. But now you are taking action to nationalize. You are crossing the red line. So you are trigger, you, you, you trigger the disputes. You raise the tension. And that, for, from the Chinese perspective, that opened a very good window of opportunity to break the Japanese effective control in the East China Sea. Similar to the action taken by the Philippine government in the Scarborough show in the South China Sea. And op it opened a window of opportunity for China. So more and more, I, I, I don't think I, I, um, I just want to bring you up to up right now, this, right now, um, this year, or this month, maybe in May, uh, April, let me go to April, there was agreement signed between Taiwan and Japan to govern fishing, fishing activities in the waters of the two countries surrounding Diaoita Island. They put aside the sovereignty issue and they govern the, the waters surrounding Diaoita Islands and Kaku Islands and that's within the overlapping inclusive economic zone of Taiwan and Japan. And for that agreement, we have to take note a lot of important political implication. Taiwan-Japan relations, Taiwan-China relations, and China-Japan relations. Can we ask, is it possible to have another trilateral fishery agreement among these three players? As I mentioned earlier, 1997, Japan and China had the agreement, fishery agreement, and April this year, Taiwan and Japan. Is it possible to have a multilateral fishery agreement among, excuse me, among these three players, Japan, mainland China, and Taiwan? Maybe we can go further. Joint development oil and gas in the East China Sea by following this model because the agreement was signed not by the government, but by NGO association, uh, Taiwan's Asia Pacific, uh, East Asia Association and Japan's culture, International Cultural Association. So that model can be used to maybe other things. And now on May 9th, we know the dispute between Taiwan and the Philippines. The Philippine Coast Guard personnel killed uh, one, one of the Taiwanese fishermen in the, in the overlapping close economic zone in the area of uh, Bashi, Basa, ba, Badan Island of Bashi Haisha in the southern uh, part and northern part, southern part of Taiwan and northern part of, of the Philippines. And because of that, Taiwan imposed sanctions. But at the same time, Taiwan said that maybe it's time for us to reach a, a fisheries agreement to settle disputes. If Taiwan and Japan can sign a fisheries agreement in April, why not in the coming months of future Taiwan and the Philippines signed a future agreement to govern that. And then implication were project to other wider South China Sea, Perosol Island, Spratly Island. Is it possible for Taiwan to be included in the regional security dialogue process that deal with the South China Sea issue? We talk about joint development, we talk about joint preservation and conservation, we talk about marine um, biodiversity, we talk about climate change, and we talk about Marine Peace Park ecotourism, and so on. Can Taiwan play a role? And so many, many I'm, I'm, and right now, at this moment, US position, 
rebalancing strategy toward Asia. But my personal opinion, we are seeing some kind of challenge because United States, the budget cut, um, and because the you know, defense budget and, and so on. But United States recently, the Defense Secretary Hego mentioned in Sangarilla, he said that it's going to, U.S. government is going to implement the rebalancing strategy to Asia. And do, if we are going, if we are going to do that, and the balance it will be budget and the military forces. How much you are going to input in that area? Is that going to affect the U.S. domestic physical or budgetary uh, situation? On the other hand, when you you are saying that the rebalancing strategy is not target China, but you are sending 2,005 Marines in that region. And the U.S. government has, has been saying that no, we, this re rebalancing strategy covers both military and economic. Then the challenging question is why not? 250 billion, maybe too much, maybe 25 billion U.S. dollars, not 2,500 2, soldiers, but 25 billion U.S. dollars as economic aid. Don't send military weapons or military forces, but businessmen, lawyers, to help maintain, help to manage peace and, and, and stability in the region. So that's not another challenge. So um, right now, as this movement, uh, the, the challenge is Deng uh, Second Thomas Shaw, because the 10 Philippine Marines are stationed on that warship, and they need food. Now the Philippine government wants to send helicopter to to that ship for food, to, to, to logistics su supply, and they send helicopter. What action will be taken by China? Shut it down, or keep asking the Philippine government to remove that warship, grounded or sitting on that disputed land future, not island of reef, Deng Ai or Second Thomas Shore. So there are a lot of things, and uh, I think the challenge I'm going to finish within five minutes of five, five minutes, um, challenges. The challenges come in arbitration, as I mentioned that. Uh, I was told that uh, on 3rd of June, the tribunal was supposed to begin to consider, begin to talk about rule, procedure, whatever. But I was told that the president of that tribunal dropped out. The, the, the tribunal has five arbitral judges appoint one of them appointed by the Philippine side, but four of them appointed by the Japanese judge of Italos. Italos means International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Because China did not want to go to arbitration, so the, ju the Japanese judge, the president of Italos, had the power, authority to appoint four of the members in arbitral tribunal. But then the president is the judge from Sri Lanka, and he decided to withdraw. Some people ask why, because Chinese pressure, Chinese government asked ASEAN member country to, to influence the Philippines government not go proceed to arbitration. Even the Chinese Lieutenant General in Sangarilla, he also said that well, Philippine government, there's no need to go to arbitration. Let's follow the 2002 declaration of conduct of the party in the South China Sea. We, we don't go. To, you have to implement that DOC and not to go to arbitration. But Philippines size maybe have anyway. But this president, I've, to some degree, some people say that U.S. connection and U.S. interest or conflict of interest, and his wife is from Philippines. But it's just a piece of information I, I, I trust but verify. But anyway, in this case, the uh, tribunal is is not going to to hit, to decide to, to the duo or procedure and so on. Maybe it will be a good opportunity for the United States government to use the arbitration and bring back both China and the Philippines to negotiation table. Negotiate for adoption of the regional code of conduct and postpone arbitration. In any case, arbitration is not going to judge right, rule right, right away. It takes three years, four years, it's a much complicated issue, not only 1982 law of this convention, including international law, including in, intertemporal law, 
customer international law. If you are going to have three or four years an escalation of conflict, or you put aside, postpone, and work on regional code of conduct. And I think the United States can play a very important role. So this is the last uh, opportunities. Rule of engagement, no-fly zone, for example, in the East China Sea. Can we have that kind of rule of engagement or no-fly zone in the air? Because EP3, you know that EP3 in 2001, for April 1st, 2001, US, the, the EP3 and the Chinese, the fighter, the collide. Is that going to happen in the air over the Senkaku Island or, or Diaoita Island? What about vessels? We see that the captain, Chinese captain, what was a catch, and we also see the water cannon fight between Taiwan's Coast Guard and the Japanese Coast Guard. Are we going to see that happen again? So there's a need for that kind of rule of engagement or the um, agreement to 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 deal with that, manage that conflict. Uh, so man management mechanism is very important to be proposed, discussed between, of course, Japan and mainland China plus Taiwan. But Taiwan, is, is sometimes it's not, it's not easy. So uh, we are seeing the new leaders in, in, in the Chinese government, uh, new foreign minister, ambassador to, China, to the United States, new president, and, and so on. And President Obama is going to have the new National Security Advisor, right, Ms. Rice, and, and then going to have the, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Defense, Kerry and Hegel. Are they going to, for example, push for U.S. accession to the 1982 Law of this Convention? So challenges are ahead, and a limits test for China. You are talking about a peaceful rise. And you, are, you have to be, become a responsible stakeholder. Are you going to do something to maintain peace and stability? If that's the case, are you going to take more assertive moves to counter those actions taken by other claimants, Japan, the Philippines, and Vietnam? And then will be the, the US and China relations, how to maintain a balance. On the one hand, good relationship between the two countries. On the other hand, maintaining relationship between US and US allies in East China Sea and South China Sea. Economic development, peace, stability, and then, and so on. For Taiwan, and a number of opportunity for Taiwan, Japan, and US, and ASEAN countries. So uh, I think that's the, the last slice, and I, I'm not going, not going to go into detail, but because I come from Taiwan, so I think there are a lot of challenges and opportunity for Taiwan. Of course, Taiwan's the unique political status uh, make it very difficult to deal with the, the sovereignty and maritime security issue in East China Sea and South China Sea. Taiwan is indeed a ne needs the support from the U.S. government, from the ASEAN member, con member countries, and from the mainland China to find a win-win strategy, a, a flex flexible approach for Taiwan to be included in the regional security dialogue process. For example, 10 plus 1 plus 1. When I say 10 plus 1 plus 1, which means 10 ASEAN member countries plus 1 plus 1 with hyphen 1 plus 1, China and Taiwan enter into some kind of a dialogue, negotiation. And f by using the, the model such as WTO, S World Trade Organization, by using the model APEC, or using the model Olympic, and WCPFC, Western Pacific Fishery Commission, using the concept of Chinese Taipei, a fishing entity. And then that will be Taiwan's opportunity. And it's come, f f the President Ma said that he does not oppose. He does not oppose the talk between Taiwan and mainland China for signing fisher agreement. So in the East China Sea, we are seeing that kind of trilateral fisher agreement proposed by Taiwan, but not easy. Uh, that's the Taiwan's opportunity. I think I, I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and I look forward to my two distinguished uh, commentators' uh, question and comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Song. Uh, uh, let's your uh, analysis is uh, not only interesting but uh, careful in its uh, balance between 
uh, diplomatic and non-diplomatic answers to the questions that you raise. Uh, I'd like to uh, go here directly to, uh, to Paul Jara, um, but, um, but I wanted to raise a question uh, with, for both uh, Paul Jara and Mike Pillsbury, and, and that is that, and please, uh, after answering my question, go on to your comments on Dr. Song's presentation, but um, the question was raised in Dr. Song's remarks, uh, who is changing the status uh, of the South China Sea and the East China Sea? And I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about that. Uh, and even more interested in knowing what, um, what you think the limitations of diplomacy are in resolving the issues um, that Dr. Song's presentation brought up. So let's, uh, Paul, why don't you, when we proceed to you here, and then <coughs> after that, uh, Mike Pillsbury, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. Oh, and by the way, I failed to introduce myself when I began speaking. I'm Seth Cropsey, uh, fellow here at the Hudson Institute. And author of a brilliant new bestseller called May Day. About, Thank the, you, Mike. about the decline of the U.S. Navy. Um, good morning. Nice to see you, and uh, it's nice to be seen by you, and it's nice to see some old friends in, in the audience. Um, who is changing the status quo in the South China Sea and the East China Sea? I think it's quite clear that. People's Republic of China is changing the status quo <coughs> in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Um, they will tell you that, um, and I'll get at this a little bit later in my specific remarks, they will tell you that they had to because the UN, the abominable UN Convention on Law on the Sea required them to do so. Um, the fact of the matter is that not only did they, uh, they stipulate their claims as required by the treaty, but they've raised the ante with the deployment of military and paramilitary forces to back up those claims. So there shouldn't be any question about who is raising the ante in the South China Sea and the, in the East China Sea. This is a dangerous game being played by the People's Republic. Um, Seth's second question is equally intriguing and important because what the <coughs> Chinese have done here with regard to limits of diplomacy is stipulate that there are in fact limits to diplomacy. And most of us would prefer to talk about these issues, negotiate them, litigate them, legislate them in some cases. Um, but in fact, the Chinese want to bull the way through. I mean, the prospect and, and the, excuse me, the picture of the Chinese bullying the Filipinos is instructive here. It's instructive. And there's more of this coming. So those are my answers to Seth's questions. Michael. A and Paul, if you'd like to comment on the presentation, that would also... Do you want me to continue to, to my yes, comments? Yes, yes. Please. Okay. Well, I, if I didn't already suck all the air out of the room, I will... I'll tell you what I think about the presentation, but more specifically, and more to the point, what I think about the situation in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Um, first, I want to point out that, at least for the moment, figuratively and literally, Mike Pillsbury is to my left here. So for those of you who know Mike Pillsbury, that means something. Um, I, I feel sorry, um, 
not for the Japanese who were in the middle of all of this in the Senkakus, but I feel sorry for Taiwan. And the reason I feel sorry for Taiwan is because Taiwan is really on the hot seat. Taiwan is going to have to decide between territorial claims, which it holds, from its perspective as a legitimate government of China, and which side it wants to be on in what's developing in the Asia Pacific. So let me tell you what I think is developing in the Asia Pacific, which is tantamount to getting the big picture right before we can think about any of these issues. What's happening is not a series of crises that might lead us to conflict. What's happening is there is a, an underlying conflict epitomized by a series of crises. Um, there is underway now in the Asia Pacific and perhaps more broadly on the, in the Indo-Pacific a strategic meeting engagement going on between essentially China and the rest of us. You could, you could specify that it's between China and the United States, but I think it's broader than that. I think it's between China and the rest of us. I think the evidence of that is quite clear, um, but, but for many, um, many people, certainly many Americans, and I think elsewhere as well, equally, this requires suspending disbelief because for those of us who lived through the Cold War, you have to think, oh no, not again. And if you didn't live through the Cold War, thinking, oh no, this could really be terrible. And it could be. It could be. It could be another disastrous cataclysm. And if you think about, just go back just 200 years. You don't have to go back further than that. And think about these strategic meeting engagements, each one of which, with one exception, which have resulted in disasters, cataclysms, paroxysms, tens of millions of deaths, and uncounted, untold treasure. The Napoleonic Wars, the rise of Wilhelmine Germany, the rise of Hitler and Togo, Stalin and the Cold War, each of these in its own way was a strategic meeting engagement that led to bloodshed, gigantic wars. The only strategic meeting engagement over the last 200 years that didn't was that between the United States and Great Britain. It's not, that's pretty good for us, but pretty bad for the rest of the world because the, the, the majority of these cases were really, as you know, you don't have to know much about history to know how bad these were. So that's what we're in for if we're not very careful, and I'm not sure we're being very careful because not enough people have suspended disbelief about this basic fact. This is what's going on. So I feel sorry for Taiwan because Taiwan is caught between a rock and a hard place. In addition to its unique and very uncomfortable position in the, in the world, it has to, in these particular instances that Dr. Song has talked about, has to choose between territorial claims and which side it's going to be on. Now that gets pretty tough when uh, the United States and Japan have one view of who, of who owns the Senkakus and China and Taiwan have another view. Um, now, Dr. Sung, I thought, was, was, was brilliant when he introduced himself as, on the one hand, a lawyer, and on the other hand, as a political scientist. But um, lawyers looking at this are looking at the international law aspects. Political scientists are looking for models of behavior. As a strategist, I'm looking for which side are you on, because there are basically two sides here. Um, now. I, I want to get just a little bit into, because I'm not an international law expert. I'm not uh, really, I'm not, I'm certainly not an international lawyer. And I'm not even an expert on the UN Convention of Law on the Sea. But you can trace the origins of these crises to the UNCLOS. 
because the UNCLOS raised issues that were never issues before. They sub-optimized the things like seabed resources and caused international conflict and territorial disputes, in the, not least in the, in the uh, manifestation of EEZs, which never existed before. And if you look at the UN Convention on Law on the Sea and you look at the, um, the enforcement and arbitration mechanisms, you just don't want to go there. So this is bad law. It's bad law. And it's also, and this is the most important thing, it is a terrible mistake to think that America's moral and legal authority rests on its, its um, accepting the UN Convention on Law on the Sea. That's just, that's not logical, in my view. So, <clears throat> if we are in a strategic meeting engagement with the Chinese, then the question, the next question, the proximate question is, are we already at war? And ask yourself this question. Do we have fronts? Do we have bulletins from the front? Do we have... Um, mothers writing to their sons at the, in, in battle with the Chinese? Not exactly. So it's hard to recognize. But we're in cyber conflict. We're in media conflict. We're in psychological conflict and legal conflict with the Chinese. The Chinese have told us so. The Chinese think we're already at war and they are conducting war. The Chinese think that war is the normal state of affairs. Conflict is the normal state of affairs. And this is all playing out, including cyber and space, in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. So you're getting a good dose of this, but there's much, much more of this going on than is apparent in the front pages of the newspapers. Um, one example of this, which pertains to Taiwan, which I want to point out is that the Chinese have convinced everybody along the way that in order to keep, that we have to go along with what China is doing and saying in order to keep the Taiwan Straits stable and peaceful. And much of our foreign policy and military policy is designed around that end, to keep the relationship between Taiwan and China from exploding into military conflict. The fact, that, however, is that the situation in the Taiwan Straits is neither stable nor peaceful. It's changing all the time in favor of the Chinese. And it's, there are thousands of ballistic missiles array and aircraft and infantry divisions arrayed across the Taiwan Straits. This is not a peaceful nor stable situation. Now, one of the interesting things that, that this, this, these remarks on the East China Sea and the South China Sea brings to mind, in my view, is that the Hudson Institute should conduct a study, and you should all contribute the funding to it, of Chinese revanchist claims. Because if you think for a moment that they are limited to Taiwan or the Senkakus or reefs that... that in, that the Filipinos are occupying, you have another thing coming. There's a museum, there's a PLA, a People's Liberation Army Museum in Beijing that shows all of these claims. And they're not all maritime claims and they're not all, they're, many of them are continental claims. And many of them extend far to the west and far to the north. So if you think that you can feed the beast and somehow allay its, its hunger, you can't. You're not going to. You're just going to encourage it. Um, if, she, if, the, if the leader of China gets the Nobel Prize for sorting things through, then I suggest that we give Don Corleone from The Godfather the Nobel Prize for insurance salesmanship because his approach is to go into a neighborhood size it up and say, boy, you got some really nice plate glass windows here. It would really be a shame if somebody broke them. And then he sells insurance, right? So um, I, I, th th this is, and the fact of the matter is that 
This, this just goes on on a daily basis with the Chinese. So um, I think there's sort of an interesting um, dynamic now between the implications of the military buildup that's going on, and that's what it is. Some have characterized it as an arms race. The military buildup going on in the Asia Pacific and international law. Because on the one hand, China's militarized emergence has, re has caused the pivot to Asia, the so-called pivot to Asia. It has its non-military aspects, but it certainly has its military aspects. But on the other hand, as I, as I mentioned, the, the, these clashes over interpretations of international law are, in fact, causing the military buildups. Now, let me tell you how, how in its extreme cases, this this dynamic between international law and military buildups works. Military buildup trumps it. On the afternoon of December 7th, 1941, the U.S. Navy decided, by the way, without cons consultation with President Roosevelt, which I think is interesting, to conduct unrestricted submarine warfare against the Empire of Japan. Until that moment, it was considered to be illegal, and in fact, a submarine captain caught conducting unrestricted submarine warfare by international law would have been hung as a pirate. And so when push comes to shove, international law goes away, and military force trumps it. Um, I thought that of all of the things that of the many important things that Dr. Sung <coughs> talked about, I thought that the greatest, the most interesting and, and the greatest opportunity for Taiwan was as Taiwan as a moderator and as a mediator. This is very interesting because Taiwan doesn't have, and it's not going to get because of this, and I don't propose to suggest that it would, membership in these international organizations. China's presence in China's pocketbook is just too overwhelming. However, if Taiwan doesn't have membership, it does have a microphone. And Taiwan can do and say the right things. And Taiwan hasn't been, but can. Taiwan is in a perfect position to do that. So that's everything that occurred to me to say in listening to your remarks, which I really appreciated. I thought they were very good. Um, it's good that we have uh, people like Dr. Sung coming to the Hudson Institute to talk about these issues because we need to think about them and understand them more because they are really crucial to what's going to happen in the near term. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Mike, let's hear from you and okay, then we'll open minutes. the floor to questions. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I heard Dr. Song's briefing in a much longer version uh, last year in Taipei at uh, Lin Zhengyi's Zhongyang uh, Yanzhou Yuan Academia Syndica briefing. So I have unfair advantage over Paul that this is my second time uh, to hear your briefing. And it's sort of unfair to you, Dr. Song, that you are not uh, getting to have really two hours to go into uh, your ideas uh, in more detail. Uh, you personally are making a great contribution to the issue of the South China Sea and the East China Sea. But <clears throat> I agree with Paul Giara. The most important subject in your paper today is the idea that Taiwan's president, uh, Ma Yingzhou, could play a role of some kind uh, and even earn a Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts. Uh, that seems to be your, your uh, uh, speculation, shall we say. You didn't say if President Ma Ying-jeou is asking you to help him uh, get this Nobel Peace Prize, but I think it's known in Taiwan that you advise President Ma on this issue. So my first warning to you is be careful because oh. you might get the Nobel Peace Prize, not President Ma, because you have been saying much more and had been much more detailed, uh, I hope President Ma will make some sort of speech or a long article dealing with these issues 
in uh, both legal detail and also explaining Taiwan's uh, dream, you might say. Uh, which leads me to my second point. Your proposals and your request today that the U.S. government approve or support uh, Ma visiting certain islands uh, strikes me as an American policy issue. And it's part of a 30-year or more struggle here in Washington over the question of what is Taiwan? Who does Taiwan belong to? Is it a country? Um, should we have any official officiality, as we, ter as we term it, in our relationship? Should Taiwan's president be allowed to come to Washington, D.C.? Uh, the answer, in a mainstream view, for four decades now has been no. Uh, no Taiwan president can come to Washington. In fact, can't even come to New York can't really do anything. There's a huge issue each time. There's a where to change planes, where to refuel. Uh, can, uh, can President Lee attend his Cornell reunion? These become extremely hot major issues in U.S.-China relations. So obviously from Beijing's point of view, Taiwan's role in South China Sea and East China Sea would be to support China because Taiwan's a part of China. And they would go through, if my suggestion is accepted, and President Ma makes a speech or writes a long article very close to what you have been writing over the last few years, Beijing will react. They will look at it very closely. Is he supporting China's position? Or Philippines and Vietnam, or America? And where does it fit in the debate in Taiwan over uh, a political agreement between Beijing and Taipei. As you know, there's been enormous progress, and President Ma got reelected because of it, in economic and trade and airline agreements. But Taiwan still refuses Beijing's request to have a political agreement that would focus on what is Taiwan's status. So, from Beijing's point of view, your presentation is kind of sneaking in the back door to imply that Taiwan has some kind of political status that it can take positions and make visits and do things involving Chinese interests in the South China Sea without the political agreement first with Beijing. I think wearing my Beijing red team hat, that is how Beijing perceives what you are doing and what President Ma is doing. This could be dangerous. This could be dangerous for Taiwan, for President Ma's uh, political situation. And some people, including me, believe China has a different strategic a sort of philosophy about American behavior, that they don't perceive us accurately. Some say they're paranoid. So if Beijing <coughs> believes that the U.S. and President Ma are Yinmo Gojie, hard to translate into uh, English, but let's just say connive or conniving. To use President Ma as a sort of an American stalking horse to do things in the South China Sea and elsewhere. This sets back the hopes of those in Washington who want to build trust and cooperate with China. So they would oppose your briefing and certainly oppose President Ma unless he's 100% aligned with China's position. My last point is I would encourage you, and I'm happy to help you, I think Hudson Institute needs to give you free copies of several books and reports that Hudson has done about China's strategic thinking. Uh, one of them is Seth Cropsey's new book on May Day, which is just out that addresses the global balance of naval power. Because the, as Paul Giara said, the balance of power in the South China Sea could be extremely important. This may not just be some sort of real estate uh, fisheries issue. It may be that in the backs of the heads of the leaders, there's different perceptions of what is the balance of power. Second book is Abe Sholsky's book on Chinese use of force. 
Abe Shulsky's book goes over in de great detail. It's the best book there is. Many people, including Henry Kissinger, footnote the Shulsky book, Kissinger's new book on China, uh, adapts, adopts this model. That China uses force in a deceptive, surprising way with great success to cause a psychological shock and the leaders on the other side. Not to occupy territory, uh, not to uh, invade and do regime change. And Shulsky's book gives uh, five or six examples. In each case, the Chinese were successful, even with Hanoi in 79. The Politburo went on trips or on vacations. They were so complacent that China would not attack. And during that period, China attacked. So the idea of a use of force for psychological shock against one of the nations involved in these territorial disputes is raised by Shulsky. The second one is Chris Ford, Mind of Empire about Chinese views of hierarchy, how small nations should submit and show deference to the most powerful nation. He goes through 3,000 years of Chinese history to make his case. The third book is Charles Horner. Similar idea, psychological historical effects on Chinese leadership changes uh, in policy. I, my own humble, short 20-page uh, article last year called 16 Fears is about and concerns how the Chinese look some of these territorial issues and their fear of being seen as weak and therefore perhaps from our point of view an excessively assertive approach. So Hudson Institute has a kind of approach to China involving careful study of history, psychology, use of force, the balance of power and I would recommend we give you these free books so you'll footnote them in your in your next report even though that will get us in trouble in Beijing because Beijing will see us as encouraging you uh, and interfering in uh, Chinese-Taiwan relations. So I hope that's helpful to you. I'm really sorry we couldn't give you the full two hours to go through. You know, you had at least 100 slides, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, if there are questions from the audience, this is the time for them. And uh, would you please... Uh, one recognized, uh, identify yourself and your organization, and uh, with that, let's, uh, let's throw the floor open for questions. Abe? Hi. Yeah, Abe Shulsky from, from uh, Hudson. Uh, I think one of the, the key points in what you were talking about, or, or an, a key example of what you were talking about, would be the the uh, fisheries agreement with Japan and the possibility of a, of a similar fisheries agreement between Taiwan and the Philippines, because that enables you, it seems to me, to sort of meet the dilemma that Paul Giara mentioned, which is that you both maintain the, cl the Chinese claim, but at the same time, you show that you're really on the side of trying for some sort of peaceful agreement and it raises the potential at least that if it came to a complete showdown you've already resolved your problem with say Japan and with the Philippines and so you know you no longer have a dispute with them on these on at least those issues that you reach the agreement on so it it kind of squares the circle in a certain sense so I get my, my question is what was the uh, the PRC reaction to the agreement with Japan and to any discussion of a possible agreement with the Philippines because it strikes me that, that that puts them in a little bit of a bind. I mean, on the one hand, they don't want Taiwan to simply walk away from the nine dash line. I mean, that would be seen as very provocative, I assume. But at the same time, um, there you are showing a moderate, you know, sort of pragmatic adjustment to a situation that I think the Chinese like to keep uh, either heated up or they like to keep the ability to heat it up when uh, when it when they think that it serves them so I, I was just curious as how how they dealt with the in a sense the dilemma that you posed for them by reaching an agreement with uh, with Japan and perhaps uh, going for one with the Philippines as well okay. 
Well, thank you very much for that uh, uh, very good questions. Indeed, it, it's a challenge, but from PRC's government's reaction to the agreement signed between Taiwan and Japan, there are two aspects. On the one hand, from the perspective of Taiwanese people, especially fishermen, they say, of course, we welcome that, uh, that agreement. And this agreement was signed not by the government, although governments are behind, that's for sure, but it's signed between the two associations. So the Taiwanese government, President Ma, tried to avoid that sensitive issues. And, um, but recently, President Ma, I think yesterday, he said that we like to see the uh, fisheries agreements signed between Taiwan and mainland China. And he emphasized that we use the term three parties, not three countries, in order to avoid that issue. So when I say the, the PRC government's re re reaction to that agreement from the Taiwanese people, fishermen side, yes, they welcome. So the Taiwan's office, uh, PRC's Taiwan's office said that they welcome that. But from the government side, opposed. Because it's come to the question of the, the sovereignty issues, and then it's much more um, sensitive or complicated uh, uh, issue between Taiwan and Japan for further diplomatic relations. But one thing we, we can take note is the, the card, so the card or, or card to play by Japan and by the Philippines. Because in order to counter increasing assertiveness of China, so there's uh, maybe a reason or maybe that's one of the main reason for Japan to decide five days before the talk to say that we have to sign this agreement. And of course, another one will be from the U.S. influence, U.S. in between Japan and China and, U and China and the Philippines. The role played, I'm um, Taiwan, um, U.S. played a role to influence. Now, for example, the fisheries agreement between Taiwan and the Philippines, how, how would U U.S. government respond or, or encourage to Taiwan or Philippines to take what kind of action? Will U.S. government support that agreement signed between Taiwan and the Philippines? My personal opinion, I, I think uh, more positive side than negative side. Again, this agreement will have some policy impact on the so-called One China principle adhered, adhered to by the Philippine government. In the past, the Philippine government has been uh, applying that principle strongly, and it's very, very difficult for that government to, 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 to take more action to improve diplomatic relations with Taiwan and the Philippines. But now we are seeing more conflict between the, the PRC and Philippines in the South China Sea. So that maybe it's a, a window of opportunity. Um, but uh, interesting, interesting, interestingly to note is that the Japanese government recently respond to the, the President Ma's East China Sea Peace Initiative, especially trilateral um, talk or dialogue, the, the Japanese government say, no, we are not going to accept that. And the Japanese government denied the, 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 dispute, uh, the, the existing disputes. So, um, and then another last, last point is about the, the Taiwan-Philippine agreement or Taiwan-Japan agreement comes to the very important issue of Taiwan's international space. It's less important for Taiwan to find a way to be included in, in international governmental organization. And it's very important for Taiwan to maintain uh, a close relation, a diplomatic relationship with Japan and Philippines and come to the question about ASEAN member countries. Thank you. Um, it's, it, I, I have one observation and I have one question actually uh, for Abe Shulsky. Uh, my observation is in political science, uh, there's the model of smaller states getting bigger states into conflict. It seems to me that it's worth the investment in politics and resources to support these efforts by Taiwan to see if we can not only disprove that first supposition, proposition, but, but in fact see whether small states can get big states out of conflict and see whether there is some potential here for that. I just, I just make that comment. 
for, for Abe Shulsky, uh, I'm interested in, if you don't mind, taking just a moment because I think it, it might be instructive for what we've been discussing and, and talk about the Chinese use of power in the South China Sea and how that fits into your studies of the subject and um, what we can learn from and what we have to pay attention to uh, about this. <laughs> Thanks, Mike, for <laughs> getting me into this. Um, well, I, I guess my, my main point when I was looking at this, this issue some time ago was um, that the Chinese tendency was to sort of look for a dramatic and, you know, sort of psychologically forceful way of making a point that still didn't get them too exposed if they could avoid it. Now, obviously, sometimes they do get exposed. I mean, when they intervened in Korea in 1950, in December 1950, the initial intervention had all of those features. I mean, it was very dramatic. It was very successful at first. It even led to discussions back in Washington as to whether we should stay on the Korean Peninsula. But over time, it, it didn't work in the, in the long term. I mean, it turned out to be very costly for them. Uh, whereas, say, in 1962 in Indi with India, with respect to India, it worked, it worked brilliantly. I mean, the, the war was over. An Indian general wrote, essentially, that the war was over before we realized it had started, practically. I mean, we were expecting a long war, and you know, it, it, it ended. So I, I think what you've got to look for is possibilities that they will try something extremely, extremely dramatic. Now, we're, we're sort of focused on the issue now, so maybe the opportunities are a little bit less for them, but that they would look for some way of, uh, of, of taking a big dramatic action that'll cause a kind of uh, reassessment by the various parties. Uh, obviously, if one of the other claimants tends to overextend and, and tries to do something a little bit too provocative, that would be a perfect opportunity to respond because it would then raise the question that you just re mentioned at first. I, w we in the U.S. would be worried, well, was the Philippines getting us into a fight that was unnecessary or something? Thanks. We have a question in the back. That's Joe Bosco. <coughs> Hi, Joe Bosco, <coughs> formerly with the Defense Department and with a heavy cold. Sorry about that. Uh, <coughs> I'm fascinated with the discussion of how uh, Taiwan can resolve the dilemma <coughs> that both Abe and Mike and, and Paul and Dr. Song have pointed out, which is the existence of its territorial claims, which are in many ways coincidental or consistent with China's, and yet its desire to take an approach in international affairs that differs from that of China. Uh, I wrote a piece last year in the Taipei Times, and this p uh, past couple of months approached, uh, uh, broached it with President Ma during a, a meeting a delegation of ours had with him. And that is that he extend his East China Sea peace initiative to China's, uh, Taiwan's approach to the South China Sea. And that is, without relinquishing the nine, do nine dash line uh, claims, Taiwan can say, they ought to be resolved through code of conduct, declaration of, of uh, peaceful use of the seas, and all the other international mechanisms that are being uh, touted, which we know that China opposes. So it would result in producing what Mike's worried about, is greater uh, tension between China and Taiwan. But it would put Taiwan on the, on the, on the side of the angels, on the side of international law and, and peaceful resolution of disputes. So I wonder what, uh, whether you think, uh, Dr. Shang, that's something that ought to be. And by the way, when we approached it to, uh, to uh, President Ma, he responded positively. I haven't yet seen whether he's going to do anything about that. Well, thank you very much, to Mr. Basco. Uh, indeed, that's, that's a, a, a challenge. If Taiwan is going to propose, for example, South China Sea Peace Initiative, and comes the question about international law, and then comes to the Taiwan's claim to, for example, submerged rocks in the McClesfield Bank. And then it comes to the question of the need to revise 
Taiwan's the South China Sea policy, especially on the maritime sovereignty claim, sovereignty claims. So, and then comes the question challenge for uh, first the Mar uh, about the U-ship line, and then so so it, it's not easy. And then, uh, but on the other hand, if uh, person Ma is able to to solve that kind of, to to modify or to revise the position based upon international law, and that will help Taiwan to make a difference between Taiwan's South China Sea policy and China's South, South China Sea policy. On the other hand, it will uh, in, uh, make, you know, how do you say that, create a, a pressure to push both China and the ASEAN member country to move further to the adoption of the regional code of conduct in the South China Sea. But before doing that or reaching that agreement, I think Taiwan should also let the international community, especially those countries border, bordering the South China Sea, that we need to be included. And so for, for this in, in, initiative, um, as in fact, uh, my, this is from academic people like me, and I talk with uh, Dr. Don Emerson, and there are a number of scholars, uh, scholars again, not governmental officials, who think, why not, if you have the East China Sea Peace Initiative and the guidelines, why not East China, uh, South China Sea Peace Initiative? I think we have uh, time for one more question, if there is one. Mr. Speaker? Let me pose two comments and a question. And, uh, two comments and a question. Basically, more from, a, I guess you call it a, a political economic pragmatism rather than an academic side. That's where my life has been. But you know, if you, you're an observer, you're old, old as I am, you've watched this scenario for a lot of years. And starting with the, uh, basically after post uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, left China, you know, Taiwan was a big issue. That's where the saber, saber rattling was. That was the whole focus of uh, that president, that government, as opposed to uh, the United States and, and its associates. When the Mao's government in China wanted to flex its muscle, it, 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 there was never any direct confrontation. It was a confrontation in Korea, and several, a decade later, it was confrontation in Vietnam, and that's where they basically confronted the free world. Now, uh, Dr. Song said something interesting. He said that uh, if the United States was going to make an investment, it ought to be, a, I understood you say, an economic investment, business. What's happened, what happened with, with Taiwan and China, and, and Taiwan, had, you know, in my experience in years in the Congress, what Taiwan was very good at was politicizing their situation with China because almost every congressman at one time you know, got a free ride to Taiwan. And they got sold on the government, they got sold on the, the, the sovereignty of, of Taiwan. But yet what was happened when as the economic uh, you know, wall kind of melted between uh, China and Taiwan, almost all the, all the capital that, that helped with the Fushan province development came from Taiwan. And so the economic ties between China and, and Taiwan in realistic situations means that there's never going to be any you know, real uh, military uh, force. But yet that's always a place where that's the only real place that the, the Chinese government can saber rattle is on the straits. That's the only f physical place that there is. So my question is basically, you know, why are, you know, we can talk about the, 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 the diplomat, the, the law, but the law doesn't, you know, exist, and somebody made this point, if there's military action, there's no law. And so, you know, why don't we look at this more as an economic situation? I mean, the, if, if, e if, if we can engage China and all these other countries, because all the issues, when you talk about the islands and uh, these things are all end up being economic issues. They're fishery issues. They're, they're oil issues. They're, you know, uh, these types of things, trade issues. Uh, we need to look at this in a more economic sense, I believe, than even the international law and military sense. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, respected uh, 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 speaker, uh, the, the Mr. Uh, Hoster. Indeed, very, very good question. And I have been thinking about 
the, the disputes both in East China Sea and especially in South China Sea, that kind of economic approach. Even I, I would elaborate a win-win, win strategy approach. And for the United States, the possibility to be dragged into armed conflicts, I think is increasing. And if that's the case, the, 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 the obligation or burdens, morally or military, whatever, strategically, to increase U.S. involvement in that region also increase. And, and, and the question is, is that good for the U U.S. national interests? Now, if U.S. interests, a couple of days ago, um, the uh, assistant Secretary Yong said that one of the U.S. national interests in the South China Sea is lawful commercial development oil and gas, for example, and certainly freedom navigation come to the trade issue because the trade between the United States and ASEAN member country, which is going to have the economic community in 2015. And then there's the economic relationship with the U.S. and China. Right now, China's the, the tourists, for example, in the United States, numbers, is number seven or something, is increasing a lot. So that economic approach is very important. And, um, but the question is how to how to find a way to, between the United States and and, and 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 China. And I don't know what what issue they are going to talk about. I hope they talk more about economic issue in in, in California. But from Taiwan's perspective, that kind of economic uh, development, we like to see U.S. involvement and we like to see U.S. Uh, uh, engagement or economic uh, um, support especially TPP issue. I'm talking about TPP and asset. Uh, and TPP, for example, uh, Taiwan, President Ma said that within eight years, we are going to join the TPP. So, um, but on the other hand, the cross-strait relations, that kind of economic dependency is going to stop Taiwan from, it's going, it's go going to be the threat. Or because that will be used by the, uh, the Chinese government as an instrument of foreign policy, what if 2000, this coming year, the election in Taiwan, and the KMT government did not, that does not have a, a, a victory, a win, and, or in the 2016 presidential election, and we have a Green Party, a DPP, wins the election. And that comes to question economic tie between Taiwan and mainland China, which will be affected. But in any case, but thank you, thank you very much for, for this question. I still believe that if the United States is going to convince China or other international mm. communities that the rebalancing strategy toward Asia is not only target China or not only focusing on military aspect, maybe the United States, U.S. government sh can, can consider to take some action which move toward more economic side. One last note, in 1992, there was an oil gas con contract signed between the Chinese CNOOC and the U.S. Crestone oil company based in Denver. And in 1992, so in 1994, they began to do some kind of research or a, a survey. The, the, the Vietnamese warship, four warships, warships sent into the, in 1994, I think April 16. So they, they send that over and then to force the, the Chinese the survey versus and, and the U.S. Uh, Crestone uh, company to withdraw. So what about in the future, U.S. important oil uh, uh, interests and uh, free, uh, trade, is that possible for U.S. to, to do more and balance, re rebalance, military, economic, rebalance strategy toward Asia and toward China. That's my response to Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much for your question. Paul, you want to? Thank you, for, uh, sir, for bringing up the, the underlying issue of military behavior and the alternatives to that. Um, I think, unfortunately, we've seen this movie before. Um, in the 1930s, uh, we were Japan's uh, largest source of oil and steel and that didn't work out. The Japanese behavior didn't change. We stopped those exports and eventually we were, in w we were at war. In the meantime, the Japanese were fueling their fleet and building their fleet with those exports. Um, the reason I, I mention that is because a, a recent uh, observation by a senior uh, Singapore academic pointed out 
that like the Japanese military then, the young officers who are taking control of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army now, um, have so many resources that they're not asking what they should do, they're asking what they can do. And this is, this is a very bad situation. Now, it would seem to me that, I mean, your observation, let's, let's jaw jaw, let's trade trade rather than war war, is, is, is perfectly correct, except that the Chi it doesn't seem to be working with the Chinese. While our economic relationship with China was burgeoning, and it's, it's at, even at the beginnings, the Chinese were um, strategizing and how to defeat the United States militarily, and they've built up their military to do just that. So over the last 20 years, our mutual planning was all about Taiwan, and if this is Taiwan, the United States and China were planning to either defend or attack Taiwan, and that strategy, those strategy vectors have come like this. And my sense is that this is sui generis uh, in China, because the Chinese, for no obvious reason other than sort of historical animosity, <coughs> have decided to militarize their emergence. But this is like, as I said, these earlier iterations of the emergence of, of powers that chose uh, militarization. So it, I think we've tried the economic route, and it just hasn't, in my view, it hasn't worked with the Chinese. And in fact, it's weakening us because it divides our councils on the one hand, and it, it ships money that the Ch Chinese are using against us in all sorts of ways to Beijing. Well, and a final comment here, and we'll conclude these proceedings. To the extent that, that there should be or could be a balance between economic and military focus on the problem, from the American side, the, the military element of that is severely proscribed. It's, it's limited by uh, future budgets. And if the response to that is, well, then the US fleet will simply move ships from other places in the world uh, to the West Pacific or the area around the South China Sea, uh, I can't imagine that uh, either China or our friends in the region um, would take this extremely seriously because it's a demonstration um, that you have to move things when there's a problem. And if they can be moved from one place to the Western Pacific, then if another crisis comes up somewhere else, they can move, be moved from the Western Pacific to some other place. So I, uh, um, I like the idea of balance, but on the path that we're headed right now, I don't see it as realistic. And with that, I would like to thank Dr. Song, uh, Paul Jara, Mike Pillsbury, um, and our, uh, our audience, uh, attendees, for their good questions and their excellent listening. And uh, Hope you will join us again uh, on future occasions that deal with this and similar subjects in Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Didn't get to the question.